Here are my five clean code principles that all software engineers need to understand, starting with principle number one, which has to do with unnecessary levels of nesting. So I challenge you, have a look at this code and ask yourself what's wrong with it and how could you make this code cleaner? And by the way, all of the principles that I share with you in this video, are ones that I recently saw many beginner and intermediate programmers making mistakes with when I was conducting some mock interviews. So these are really relevant. And even though they may seem minor, a lot of programmers make these mistakes and it makes their code seem messy and non-professional. So you definitely want to learn these and make sure that you don't make these mistakes, especially in an interview. Okay, so let's have a look into this code right here. Now, at first glance, it may not seem so bad, and obviously it's only 18 lines of code, so it really can't be that bad, but you might notice that we have a lot of levels of nesting. We have if statements, inside of if statements, inside of other if statements, and at first glance, if I'm trying to analyze this code and kind of follow along with the logic and the code paths, it can be difficult for me to understand exactly what this is doing. It takes me a second, I have to read through this line, then this line, then this line, and then line up, for example, what I'm actually supposed to be doing, which is appending this into the results array, or look at all these print statements for these various error messages. And you can imagine as we get into more and more levels of nesting here, it gets more and more complicated and just a lot more difficult for us to follow along with. So what you wanna do here is you wanna try to make this code as flat as possible. You wanna reduce any unnecessary nesting and you wanna change the way in which you're executing these conditions so that you can stick with just one or two levels of nesting rather than going super deep here and having these complicated branches. So let me show you in real time how we would go about fixing this code. So we'll leave this down here. I'll just kind of add a comment and say, old code and up here I'm going to write the new code. So we're going to start by writing something like this. If the number is less than or equal to zero, then we're going to take this value here. So print skipping the number is not positive and we are going to continue to the next number. Now what this does is rather than checking the condition that we want to be true until we eventually kind of append this number to the results list, we check the opposite. So we flip the condition around and then we disqualify the number and move on to the next one at the very top of our for loop. So we have this first check, we check if it is not positive. If it's not positive, then we can continue because we know we wouldn't eventually branch into these other levels. Okay, now we can do the same thing for the second condition. So we can just copy this and we can say if the number mod two, and then rather than checking if it is equal to zero, we're gonna check if it's not equal to zero, then same thing, we can copy the thing that we wanna do here. So we wanna print this out and we can continue. So again, rather than checking if it is divisible by two or it is even, we're checking if it is not even. If it's not even, then what we're gonna do is continue and disqualify the number here in this kind of flattened statement. Okay, and then lastly, we have the condition that we do wanna check. So there's kind of multiple ways to do this. But what I'm gonna do is say, if the number is greater than or equal to 100, then same thing. I'm gonna take this print statement. I'm gonna say print skipping, and then I'm gonna continue. And now we can copy what we do wanna do. I'm gonna get rid of all of this. And I can just do this at the bottom of the for loop. So what I've done is rather than having all of these levels of nesting, I've checked the few conditions that if true would disqualify this number from being added to the results list. And I've checked them in singular if statements. Now it's very easy for me to see what it is that I'm actually checking. So I'm checking again if the number is less than or equal to zero, if the number is not divisible by two, if the number is greater than 100. These are kind of the opposites, right? The negated version of what we were checking before. And then I print out the error message and I continue. Whereas if none of these things are true, that means that this number qualifies like we would have had in those nested if statements, and we can append it to the results list. Hopefully that makes sense, but this is a very common thing that you should definitely get used to doing using the continue and sometimes the break keywords to really flatten out your code and have less levels of nesting so it's easier to understand. So let's move on now to the next principle, which has to do with variable naming. Now, one thing to keep in mind, whenever you're writing variables, functions, or coding in any language, there's usually a set of standards or a style guide that you should follow. In the case of Python, that style guide is known as PEP8, and it defines things like the spacing you should have within your code, the way you should write variables, classes, etc. And you'll see here, actually, in my editor, I sometimes get these highlights where it's telling me that I'm kind of breaking this PEP8 standard, and it's expecting maybe two blank lines after this class or function definition, and it only found one. Now, the reason I'm getting these highlights is because I'm using the IDE called PyCharm. 
Now, PyCharm is one of the best IDEs and tools to use if you write any Python code at all. I use it a ton, and I actually have a long-term partnership with them where I can give you guys three months extended free trial for the PyCharm Professional Edition. Now, there's two versions here. There's a PyCharm Community Edition, which is free forever to use, and then a PyCharm Professional Edition, which has a ton of additional features that make it easier to work with Python in a professional setting. If you want to check out the Professional Edition and use it again for free for three months, you can do that from the link in the description due to the partnership that I have with PyCharm. It's really good, especially if you're working with Flask, FastAPI, Django, various machine learning frameworks, as all kinds of integrations and plugins, and you'll see some of the advantages of it in this video. Anyways, let's get into this example. So you can see in this example that this code is pretty difficult to process and to understand immediately. I'm trying to read this process data function. Sure, we have some doc string that you know tells us what it's doing, but if I want to understand all of the logic going on here, I'm kind of guessing at what some of these things are doing. I have like for i in D, if i at TP, I don't even know what that means, is equal to CUST, which I assume is maybe customer, and I have this I ACT, like it's very ambiguous. I don't know exactly what this is doing, and it would take me a second to kind of wrap my brain around this code and try to figure out what's going on. Now, this obviously is not good. It makes it much more challenging to read and understand the code, especially many months down the line when you've forgotten what you've written. And that's why you always want to make sure you're using very good and descriptive variable names. So if we have a look at this example here, this is actually the exact same code as what we had before, but now it's rewritten to be cleaner and to use valid variable names. And notice that right away when I start reading through this code, even if I'm not a programmer, I can pretty much understand exactly what this is doing because I've written the variable names much more descriptively and I've taken that extra minute or two to make sure the code is actually readable. So again, if we go back to this one, you know, try to understand what this is doing. We have I, we have TP, CUST, balance, process data. Nothing is descriptive. Even in the data here, all of the different attribute names or keys in our dictionary just really aren't clear. Whereas if we switch over to the fixed version, you can see that we now have filter active customers. We're taking in a list of customers. We have a more descriptive doc string here that explains what this is doing. We have valid customers as our list. We're not using I when we're iterating over customers, we're using something like customer. We're checking the type is active. Everything is just so much easier to understand. And really all we did is we just changed a few variable names here and cleaned up the code so that anyone, even if they weren't a programmer, would be able to read this. Now that's what I wanted you to get from this example here is that even if you're not an advanced programmer, even if you don't know the programming language, you should be able to understand what the code is doing if it's written well. That's the way that I always kind of mark if the code is readable or not. Could I give this to someone like my mom who knows nothing about programming and could she get a general sense of what the code is doing because of how well I've written it and how descriptive the variable names are. Moving on, the next principle I have has to do with classes and functions and something known as the single responsibility pattern or the single responsibility principle. In short, what this says is that we want to keep all of the code that we're writing small and focused and try not to do too many things at once. So for example, we can look at this function here called process orders. Now it's not super long, but we can see immediately that it's doing a lot of stuff. Like we have a for loop, we're kind of going through these orders, we're doing some kind of filtering here, we're then generating a receipt for these orders, returning the receipts, and like yes, we can kind of understand what's going on, but again, at first glance, it requires a significant amount of brain power for me to know immediately what this is doing. I can't just really quickly skim it and fully understand what's happening here, and especially because the function name, sorry if I go back here, is called process orders, I don't really know what that means, right? Now I can read the doc string, but again, it's just not super descriptive and it would be better if we could split this code up into multiple different parts where I can understand it more easily. Now there's a lot of different reasons to do this, but let me show you the fixed version of this code and how much easier it is to understand. Okay. So all I've done in this fixed version of the code is I've simply created a few small functions that are just the different operations that we are performing in that larger piece of code. So now if I were to go to my process orders function here, you can see that I can read this for loop and because I've split things into functions, I can just read the function names and understand what this function is doing. So it says four orders in order. If the order is not fulfillable, okay, then of course I'm gonna continue. Otherwise, I'm gonna update the inventory, generate the receipt, add that to some list, you know, print out some processing string and then return the receipts. 
So immediately here in like five seconds, I was able to understand what this function is doing. And if I care about the implementation of any of these functions, I can go and I can read them. And because they're small and they're focused, I can understand what they're doing quite quickly. I can test this code more easily and I can fix something or change something in the area in which it actually happens. Again, if we go back here and I wanted to maybe change something in this function, that's a little bit of a nightmare now because there's so many things going on. And I first need to understand what it is that I'm actually changing, the area that I'm getting into, and make sure it doesn't affect any other part of this code. Whereas in this example, everything's split nicely into small, easy to read and understand functions. So I know I can go and change one of these functions, swap them out, and I'm not too concerned about it affecting other pieces of the code. So we're moving on to the next principle here, which has to do with magic numbers. Now a magic number, at least my definition, is pretty much any value that isn't really associated with some kind of name, and it's not clear exactly what it is or where it came from. Now here's an example of a bunch of magic numbers inside of a function that again, kind of follow that example that I mentioned or that definition that I mentioned for a magic number. So you can see here that what we're doing is calculating some shipping costs. We have some weight and then we have some destination that we're going to. And we can see based on the destination, we have kind of some minimum weights. And then if you're over that weight, there's some kind of cost. Now, sure, we can understand what this means, but these values are kind of coming out of nowhere. And if I wanted to change one of these values later on, I'd you know possibly change the wrong one or not even know what these values really mean. Again, it's more about at first glance being able to fully understand what these things are. And when you have all of these kind of constant numbers, you would want to group them together in some kind of data structure rather than just having them listed here as return values outside of some type of function. So I'm going to show you an example of how you can fix something like this. But generally, whenever you have these constant values, things like numbers or strings, even tuples, sometimes lists or pairings, you want to try to store those in some kind of variable or data structure that defines exactly what they are. So the user knows what this value is and why it exists. Anyways, let's go here to this fixed file. Now I've gone a little bit overkill here just to really make this super clear, but you can see that I've imported this named tuple from collections in Python. Now this allows me to have kind of names for the different values inside of the tuple. So I know which one is a weight and I know which one is a fee and it's super clear. So we have max weight limit, shipping fee, for example. And you can see that I then create this data structure where I store what previously we had as all of these magic values. Now it's very clear to me that in the US, we have some maximum weight limit of five. And if you go over that, then the shipping fee is 10. Same thing for all of the other values here. And then same in Canada, Europe, etc. And there is no question what these values are. And we have a name associated with each of them. Then we have some kind of default flat rate. So if you don't you know, kind of qualify for any of these, then this is the default rate that you would get. And then we can simply use this data structure to grab the value. So you can see that we use the dictionary, we get the destination that then gives us this list here. We then check the weight against all of the values in the list and then return what the shipping fee is. The code is super clean, very easy to understand. And now we can just go to this data structure and we could add another destination. So maybe we add Australia or we add Asia or something along along those lines and the code will just work as it does because that's how we've set it up. So not only is the code more readable, but it's actually more functional and it works more reusably. Anyways, let's move on to the next principle. So the last principle here has to do with an unnecessary use of comments. Now, a lot of beginner programmers like to think that writing clean code means writing a ton of comments and they start writing comments after every single line. And especially in an interview, I can tell if someone's a bit inexperienced if they're trying to make their code clean by just commenting literally everything that they're writing. That is super unnecessary. In my opinion, it shows a little bit of a lack of experience. And that's why I want to mention it to you here. So have a look at this code. And at first glance, you may not think there's anything wrong with this, right? We just have some kind of harmless comments, you know, apply the tax to the price, apply the discount if applicable, apply the coupon code if applicable, ensure the price is not negative, return the final price. Now, again, there's nothing inherently wrong with this code, but these comments are just not necessary if you write the code properly. If you write the code with proper variable names and it's self descriptive, what that means is that the code documents itself. It doesn't actually need comments because you write it in a way where you can just read the code without any of those comments. So I'm going to show you an example of kind of this fixed version and then go over some more reasons why you want to reduce your use of comments. Okay, so have a look at this right here. We now have calculating the price with discounts and I only have a single comment here other than the ones where the expected value, but that's just kind of for this example. 
So you can see that we've now changed the function name, so calculate price with discounts. All of the parameters now have clear names, base price, tax rate, discount percentage, etc. And I don't need to comment all of these lines because it's obvious what these things are doing. The tax amount, well, that's just the tax amount. The price after the tax, that's exactly what it is. The discount amount, the price after the discount, this code is documenting itself because of the way that I wrote it. Now again, nothing really wrong with this code here other than the lack of descriptive variable names, but when you have comments, these can be hard to maintain because when you change a line of code, you then need to change the comment and a lot of times comments kind of get stuck in production code bases and they don't get updated or they're out of date. So you want to make sure that if possible, you write code that is self-documenting that doesn't require comments and you only put a comment if it's absolutely necessary and you attach it to a particular line or section of code. Again, that's because comments are just difficult to maintain, code is constantly changing, and a lot of times people forget to change a comment or the comment doesn't accurately describe what's going on in a particular section. So you don't need the comments if you're writing code in a way where you can read it without them. Hopefully that makes sense, but just something to keep in mind, try not to use a comment unless you absolutely have to. There's nothing wrong with doing it, but you don't wanna have comments littering your code. It can just make it a little bit messy. So with that said guys, that is gonna wrap up this video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next one.